Good evening. I'm Richard Summer, professor here and dean of the Daniels faculty, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Profit and Loss Symposium. First, as has become our practice, I want to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto and this faculty operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Okay, my job this evening is to really turn over the podium to Lisa Steele. I just want to say very quickly, and I'll, have, I'll repeat this tomorrow when, when we have the Fuller Symposium uh, beginning at 9. Um, this event, Profit and Loss, is uh, organized by Lisa Steele and uh, Kim Tomzak, who, um, who cooked, cooked this up on the occasion of their um, well, I don't really like to use the word retirement. Um, their, the conclusion of their long and storied service uh, at the University of Toronto and more recently at, um, well, for the last decade at, at, our, at our faculty. Um, so we tried to think about what would be a, the right kind of event to mark that, this, uh, 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 change uh, in their relationship to the school, and um, this, this, so this this event really came out of that that discussion and that sense that uh, we would do something that really would reflect on a piece of history that is both important because it's almost a half century since the Vietnam War, but also is very personal to uh, to both um, Lisa and Kim, particularly to Lisa's experience and her. Um, move uh, from her youth in the United States to, uh, to Canada. Uh, so we'll have an opportunity to talk about that more tomorrow. Um, but with that, I will just want to say, first I want to thank you in advance for our putting all this together and uh, call Lisa to the stage who's going, uh, are you both doing it? But Lisa and Kim who are going to make the introduction tonight. So thank you for coming. We have notes. <laughs> yeah, we have to keep things on time. Thank you, Richard, uh, very much for the introduction and uh, the land acknowledgement. I'd also like to, to point out and remind people that there is an exhibition downstairs called the uh, New Circadian, that's what it's called. Circadia. New Circadia. New Circadia. Circadia. Adventures in Mental Spelunking, which I highly recommend. It's going to be open all day tomorrow. Yeah. Yes, um, good evening, thank you very much for coming. Profit and loss, artists, writers, and curators consider Vietnam, the war, and its effects. This symposium provides a platform for artists to show and discuss their works that touch on the time frame of the Vietnam War, as well as curators and writers to present their research into this era. This will include artists who looked at the war from inside the protests in America that were increasing in the mid-1960s as the war intensified as well as younger artists who reflect on a time, some before they were born, which had a great impact on their personal lives and on the lives of their families. We would like the symposium to open up the discussions of how the events of the Vietnam War, or as other, calls, other people call it, the American War, continue to have an effect on artists and their works in the present day. We see this as an intergenerational exchange, one that will acquaint each of us with the other when looking at this complex period of history as it continues to play out, leaving us to consider William Faulkner's famous idea that the past is never dead, it isn't even past. So please join us in welcoming uh, Julia Hun. Julia Hun is a second generation Vietnamese Canadian interdisciplinary artist, filmmaker, archivist, researcher and former beauty queen. She is Miss Vietnam Toronto 2018. And she's also co-founding member of the CEA Queens Collective. Through her art practice, she investigates methods of cultural self-preservation, memory, and the construction of identities and communities in the Vietnamese diaspora.
Hello, everyone, and thank you, Lisa, for um, thank you, Kim and Lisa, for the introduction. Uh, I wanted to share a few things with you first before introducing the film. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to learn from Indigenous knowledge sharers to discuss the importance of and various approaches to reconciling our institutions and their collections. One of the presenters, Lee Markle, who is a poet and a writer and a professor of Indigenous studies here at U of T, said something that really struck me and stayed with me the whole day. She said, your body speaks your mother tongue, but if your mind is speaking English, how do you have a conversation with yourself about your health? She also spoke about how, in terms of objects in a collection, to understand and know its history, you need to hold the object, be patient with it, and while listening, you will hear a story from it. After this discussion on my way home, I decided to take that approach and hold myself and listen to my body. It was saying that I was deeply, deeply dehydrated and that I have been for a while. You know, there are logical explanations for this, given work, deadlines, and what have you. But I know that part of it is because of this anticipation of today's event. I was anticipating, what on earth does it need for me to respond and reflect on something that I have no direct memory of? I also feel that part of this is because my body is reacting to what's currently happening. Like many others in this room, we are watching closely on what's happening in Wet'suwet'en and across these lands that we are gathered on. And I'm thinking about those who are protecting and defending their lands and the water and how they've been doing this work for years and that this fight affects us all. We know that water is sacred. Water gives us life and it helps us grow. Water is beautiful, it's mysterious, and it's dangerous. Speaking for myself as a settler, I owe so much of my very existence to water. I say this to you because I am a daughter of South Vietnamese refugees. And my body is saying, you need water. In Vietnamese, water is nook, which also means country. That can mean homeland. That can mean roots. So here, my body is telling me to re-remember my water, re-remember my roots. My parents went to the shores of the Mekong River late at night to try to escape together. My mom was already in the boat as my dad was helping others on when they heard that the police were coming. He had to either run or be killed, so he ran. My mom's boat left the shore without him. The dark, open waters, as described by my mother, carried her and everyone on her boat for seven to eight days safely to the shores of Malaysia, and she would be at a refugee camp for months by herself. In the meantime, my dad tried countless times to escape until finally he was successful. That same water would carry him and everyone on his boat safely also to the shores of Malaysia at a refugee camp not too far from my mom's. My parents speak about this as a miracle, and it really is. And it's not a coincidence that my parents, once together again and reunited, would then be accepted to Canada and sponsored by a church group in Peterborough. Peterborough is a small town in Treaty 20 that's just about an hour and a half northeast of here. And in Ojibwe, Peterborough is called Ngojiwanong, which means place at the end of the rapids. That's where water calms and settles and comes to its root. And this is where my parents would resettle and where my brother, my sister, and I would be born and raised. And I share all of this with you today because I feel that there is a reason that I was guided to make this connection. And as refugees, immigrants, newcomers, and the descendants of such, it's our responsibility to remember that we've all been invited to gather here on this land as guests in the Dish With One Spoon territory here on Turtle Island in the spirits of peace, friendship, respect, and kindness. So in continuing this spirit, I ask that we treat each other with kindness in this space. History is not linear, and a friend reminded me that healing is definitely not linear, and it sometimes is never ending. We are sharing our stories and our truths, and we are all navigating our vulnerabilities, feelings, and understandings in the aftermaths of this war 
and we're all doing so at our own pace. And so I say this as a reminder, as an act of care for this evening and tomorrow, that if at any moment you need to disengage or exit the space to take a moment for yourself, that's okay. It's okay if those feelings or memories that come to the surface, including memories that might not even be your own, memories that you've inherited, make you uncomfortable. That means that your body is reacting and it's important to listen to it. I also want to address the absence of those that have been directly affected by this war. And with an event like this, I know we hope to foster intergenerational conversation and connection. But there is one absence that is very heavy to me. That's the absence of my parents. They're not in this room. It's with both an honor and discomfort that I carry to stand before you to share their story with their trust. While at this very moment, they're working. They couldn't take the time off work. And if they could, they shared that they would feel uncomfortable sitting here in this space. So as we have these discussions over the weekend, I hope we can be mindful to remember to ask ourselves who is missing and who is benefiting from these conversations. And so, finally, to introduce my film, my film, We Dance at Home, is my parents' story. They have their own negotiations of what home means to them and what role the physical home plays in becoming a space for gathering, remembering, and healing. And so really, this work is for us to celebrate our resilience and our small but mighty community. So I thank you for listening to me. And now, let's listen to their story. Small town, small city, and so friendly, safe, easy to live. Now we would like to introduce the old committee for the uh, Vietnamese Association. First, that's me, uh, I'm the uh, president. And then the uh, right president is Bob. Bob is the right president. Tại sao mà ba đứng ra để mà ba muốn là gom những người Việt lại mà tức là mình tha hương đó. Qua đây ít có người Việt mình gặp nhau người Việt Nam á mình mừng lắm. Cho nên ba muốn gặp lại xong xuôi cái mình tổ chức mình tổ chức những cái ngày Tết chẳng hạn như là Việt Nam New Year rồi mình tổ chức ấy rồi mình hẹn rồi mình rồi để gặp nhau rồi như là every every reason để mình muốn see together rồi à, quen biết nhau đây nhiều con đa số coi như người Việt đây mình biết nhau hết thôi đây nhà mình nhưng mà khi mà con thấy mà mình có cái Việt Nam community small group thôi á rồi lúc đó cứ như mọi người cũng là cũng như là ok rồi cũng có việc làm cũng có đời sống cũng 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 như quen rồi tại vì qua năm 81 82 mà cái đó là năm 90 mấy năm 90 chín mấy là cũng 8 9 năm là con đã quen được cái đời sống ở đây rồi rồi lúc đó mình có con cái mình cũng bận rộn nữa hiểu không mình biết gì thành ra cái chuyện mà mình mình lon ly hay mình buồn hay mình nhớ nhà nó cũng nó nó cũng ngắn đi nữa thành ra trong cái khoảng 7 8 9 5 10 năm đó Ừ. mỗi lần cái độ xuân về nhớ nhà nhớ kinh của mọi người đều vậy đó thì mới gom lại với nhau rồi mở nhạc xuân để cho tưởng mình nhớ về quê hương đúng không Đó, má mình nghĩ là mình không thể nào về Việt Nam á, rồi coi như là má mình nghĩ cái lên má mình là ở Vitubro, mà má mình còn nghĩ cái, lúc đó má mình còn nghĩ khi mà mình chết chắc mình cũng ở đây luôn, á. cũng như là cái lên của mình ở đây luôn á, là sách người người ta kêu bằng à, sách canh homeland. Á.
Về gì rồi tới tháng, cái ngày mà first day của New Year between all and new Nó mày ngồi mà mày tự hỏi Mình đã lớn lên đây từ nhỏ Lúc mình học cái nữ ra đây Rồi mình ở đây mà sao bây giờ cái cảm giác nó mình nghĩ giống như là Mình về nhà cha mẹ giống như là mình Về thăm á Mình visit chứ không phải là của mình á Nhưng mà lúc mà mình ở là nhà cha mẹ là của mình mình thấy nó vui về về mình thấy cảm thấy hơi lạc lỏng ừ. chứ lạc lỏng nó cũng như con phiêu là lonely trong cái mai á ừ. mặc dầu anh em gần gũi vui vẻ lúc đó rồi xong rồi chia tay hiểu không cái gì xuống má năm cái gì vậy nhưng mà trong cái giúp đau má mì cảm thấy nó lonely trong cái mai của mình đó. khi má mì trở về đây á má mì rất là happy rồi má mì nghĩ rồi mình vô bác cái, cái hôm của mình đó cái house của mình đúng không là nó ở đây nè thì người ta hỏi chứ Where your home? mình ở đây không qua do hôm thì mình biết cái người tùy theo có đối tượng người hỏi thí dụ như má mì gặp bà tây khi nó đi quyền qua do hôm thì má mì sẽ nói bít còn thí dụ như giờ người việt ừ. mà gặp nhau ở canada chẳng hạn như mình đi công tô mình gặp ô oh, lâu quá không gặp nhà mẹ ở đâu chị quyên về chị ở đâu thì má mì sẽ nói bít đúng không còn nhiều khi khi nó đi má mì làm thì đây là đây là câu hỏi thật sự có làm mình nói chuyện hỏi hỏi chứ ví à, dụ hỏi what your international what your country ví dụ vậy má mì nói việt nam ừ. thì người ta hỏi where not at sao tất nhiên người ta đã hiểu thì lúc đó má mì mới nói là sao còn thứ nói. hai nữa là ví dụ gặp người việt á thì ta hỏi À, bây giờ ở đâu thì mình nói Pitero còn ta có hỏi thêm một câu nữa ta hỏi uh, quê ở đâu? đâu của mình mình sanh ra chỗ mình ừ. bon đó thì mình nói uh, ở uh, Mỹ Tho Tiền Giang hay dụ vậy thì ba ba với má mì ở Mỹ Tho là thành phố cái tỉnh cái tỉnh Rocho nó là Tiền Giang ở đi lâu thì lần lần nó quen thời gian nó làm cho mình quên đi bớt chút xíu càng ngày mình lớn đi thì mình ở đây mình sống lâu hơn thì cái mình nhớ đây nhiều hơn cái điếp đau của má mẹ với ba không 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 thể thay đổi được tại vì ví dụ về đi tới một cái người việt ấy, má mẹ cũng cảm thấy mình trở về nhà Um, we too were hoping that your parents would be here. Um, did they go to the real Asian screening? He did. Yes. They did. Yeah. Okay. That's uh, I, I remember that. Yeah. Um, and um, for the audience here, can you tell us how they felt about watching the, the film that you made about them? Mm -hmm. So um, I made sure to collaborate with them, collaborate with them throughout the editing process because this is their story that they're sharing with me. 
And so they had a lot of input of maybe don't include that or maybe that's the wrong interpretation of what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. um, when they, so they viewed it, you know, on my laptop, not as large as this. <laughs> and so when they viewed it for the first time at Real Asian, they, they felt really proud to know that their story was resonating with other people. And, you know, I share that my parents said that they would feel uh, uncomfortable, but that was also part of that discomfort of seeing yourself on screen. Mm -hmm. But it's also that discomfort of not knowing who's going to be in the room. Mm -hmm. But my mom has the Vimeo link, and she watches it frequently, actually, because she loves it. <laughs> um, for those of you who are with us tomorrow, um, you will see that Julia is one of our two uh, performers and uh, uh, one of our researchers in our piece, uh, Afternoon Knows What the Morning Never Suspected. And, um, we, and in that, uh, you will hear um, a more extended version of what uh, Julia's uh, family, uh, how, they, how they came to Canada. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's, quite, it's quite moving. Um, I wondered if you um, uh, would, uh, would talk about what that experience was like when you re we recorded you uh, giving, talking about your, uh, how, you, how, how you got to be in Canada. Um, that time that I was helping you do the research for your work, uh, that was the first time that I was um, navigating my family's history in a more like westernized, like historical textbook context. I remember we were um, talking about like the Tet Offensive. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really know like the exact dates of it, but I know that I had heard stories from my mom who lived it and how her family responded to it. So that was the first time where I could sort of map these different linears of history together in timelines. Mm -hmm. And I really feel that that was sort of my like entry point to even having a greater understanding of Canada's role in mm -hmm. you know the war and that and I, and I know we chatted about this because um, that work screened when it was around Canada 150 mm -hmm. and Ontario 150 which is what my film was sponsored by mm -hmm. and there was that discomfort of learning about Canada's complacency and how this nation has benefited mm -hmm. from it but also I shared with you about that need to protect my parents from learning this mm -hmm. discomfort because they view it as you know, we're so happy to be Canadian, and, and that's not wrong, but it's like, for, and you know what I mean, but mm -hmm. it was, yeah. and I'm still navigating that from the learnings of, of your film. Yeah, it was one of the, um, we all, uh, the four, because there was another uh, performer researcher who couldn't be here, Ivana Dizdar, and she uh, was, uh, um, uh, the, the, the four of us would talk about how, uh, you know, how hard it is for people uh, who are immigrants to have anything negative to say about the place that has taken them in. So um, that was an understanding that I gained uh, through you. But gained it about myself, too, which I'll talk about tomorrow. Hmm. All right. Thank you very Thank much. You so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And we'll take that. Yeah. We'll take that. Thank you. I, can, I can shake your hand, too. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We, <clears throat> since we haven't really done something like this before, so with this, it's not going to be smooth. <laughs> so don't expect smooth. Um, you, uh, we would like you to join us now in welcoming Martha Rossler. Martha Rossler works in a number of media, especially video, photogra photography, and installation. And she has for many years produced works on war and the national security cl climate, co connecting daily life to home with the conduct of war abroad. Among her best known, uh, <clears throat> among her best known is the photo montage series, House Beautiful, Bringing the War Home originally made as a response to the war in Vietnam in the late 1960s through the, to the early 1970s, and reinstituted, reinstituted in 2004 and 2008 in opposition to the current wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Rossler lives and works in Brooklyn. Join us, please, in welcoming Martha Rossler.
Uh, yeah, I'm in outer space suit. Hello. Um, uh, sure. Um, I'm Martha. I'm going to take you back through the decades, which is a weird thing to be doing, but it's the only thing that makes sense, as far as I can tell, about how to talk about um, my relationship to um, the war, which was largely in Vietnam, but also Laos and Cambodia, but uh, we can just say Vietnam. Uh, that's nice. I hope that's not mine, but maybe it is. <laughs> I wish this wasn't so formal, but you know, it is. Um, oh yeah, okay. So <laughs> I thought, um, so I'm from Brooklyn, um, child of immigrants, one and a half generation. Uh, I, this seems to be moving by itself, so that might be okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, having grown up in a certain context of metropolitan New York, and, uh, uh, but actually in a working class uh, city that was part of New York and the history um, that, uh, that shaped my view and my experience. By the way, how am I supposed to be keeping time? Oh, it's right there. Okay. Um, I have a, an extravagant amount of time, which is not a good thing. <laughs> so, um, some of these names will be familiar and others won't, but on the left, I think now many people know the story of Emmett Till, the 14-year-old uh, boy who was uh, beaten to death for being black in the South and not knowing where to put his eyes or, or, or for no reason. And on the right, um, uh, a supposedly, possibly, maybe communist couple, Jews, immigrant family on the Lower East Side who were the only people who were executed, uh, the only civilians who were executed uh, during peacetime uh, for having conspired to commit a war crime, which was to give the secrets of the atomic bomb to Russia, which they kind of didn't do, but it doesn't matter. So um, that was a big, a big moment in 1953. The United States was already on to another war, which was the Korean War, which I've managed to cleverly leave out of this presentation. Uh, and we have tried to forget it, but it's, it's a war that has never ended. That is, there's no peace treaty with Korea. Um, so this is the context of development. Um, and it's not exactly chronological, but it does cover that decade from the late 50s through the early 60s. Uh, obviously the Cuban Revolution, but also the March Against Nuclear War, which started the, the campaign and the symbol, yes, this is moving on its own, um, which started in England, but was uh, vitally important to us in the U.S. And uh, Franz Fanon's books, and also the war in Algeria, which is um, interestingly part of the Vietnam story in the sense that it relates to French colonialism and the end of the French Empire and the United States inherited the, the uh, war in Vietnam after the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, and pardon my pronunciation. Okay. My first non-compliant defiant action was a very simple thing which was simply to hand out cards for the Congress of Racial Equality while I was in high school, asking people to sign cards for um, uh, civil rights, and nobody in their right mind would sign anything because you could wind up being blacklisted and never getting a job for the rest of your life. Uh, the power of McCarthyism and the Cold War in the U.S. was indescribable, and lots of people pretend it doesn't exist, but it existed, and it was amazing. But 
I mean, amazingly effective in keeping, if nothing else, the art world completely unwilling to take a position on anything, which is important to know because then the art world has spent decades trying to work its way out of having no position on anything. Uh, so this is the part of the Southern struggle to call attention to the uh, continuing power of Jim Crow to maintain African Americans as a subordinate and oppressed population who would not dare to raise their eyes, uh, figuratively speaking, as Emmett Till did, uh, and look at Whitey or S to be included. These women were arrested for reading in a library. And the lunch counter sit-ins were the most famous of these actions. I happen to know the uncle of Ang uh, no, of Michael Schwerner, who was a poet in New York, Armand Schwerner. These are the three civil rights workers who were uh, trying to help people in the South, Mississippi, to register to vote and who were kidnapped and murdered. Uh, and uh, it took f 40 years uh, for anyone to be helped to any account, the men who did it, everyone who did it, were acquitted at trial. This, they were part of the Freedom Rider uh, efforts, which were basically kids from the North going down to register people to vote. I was slightly too young to have participated in that. And then this is part of our homegrown Nazi party. Uh, various we've had various manifestations of Nazism in the U.S. We seem to have a great fondness for the swastika and for the idea of um, killing Jews and, of course, black people. Um, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party was part of the effort to open up the Democratic Party, which was largely uh, in the South, which was, of course, dominated by segregationists among the very worst people. Uh, we're still fighting this fight, of course, um, but it led to various changes, including, oh, this is moving on, so I'm sorry. Um, the primary, uh, the importance of primaries was partly propelled by, God, I can't stand this. Technology is not my friend. Uh, so this is part of the Southern Nonviolent, Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was one of the most powerful organizing groups. And uh, I actually attended this March on Washington. This is where Martin Luther King gave the famous speech, which we now refer to as I Have a Dream, but it was a march for jobs and justice organized um, by um, several people, uh, and which King was a featured speaker. And this was the 16th Street church bombing in which these four little girls who were in the bathroom in the basement getting ready um, were blown up. So one of the organizers of the march was Bayard Rustin, who could not be credited, really, because he was gay. Uh, this, uh, speaking of iconic moments, of course, these are among our legacy of um, attacking peaceful marchers with dogs and fire hoses. So I was sitting in the dorm room of a friend of mine, a leftist, who actually was Japanese, and he said to me and my partner, in about a month there's going to be a report that the PT boats of the United States will be attacked by the Vietnamese Navy, and that will be the occasion 
for a widening of the war. And I, I said, Shinya, how do you know this? And he said, I have sources. And that was a month before the Gulf of Tonkin incident. Um, every time I try to lessen <laughs> my <laughs> slight tendencies toward conspiracism, because I'm really not a conspiracist, I remind myself that I was told about the Gulf of Tonkin event a month before. It happened, only it didn't really happen. So what can I say? Um, Yeah, I'm going the wrong way. So another really important event in the 60s was the rise of what was called the youth generation and which now hilariously is called boomers. <laughs> I'm sorry, I find that so funny. Um, and I have to point out that both Bernie Sanders and I are too old to be boomers. <laughs> which is even funnier. Uh, but the importance of this student strike should not be underestimated because it was not a strike against the war. It was a strike for free speech, the pillars of which had to do with the basic idea was we are adults, you must treat us as adults, which was a novel idea for college, which was supposed to be in loco parentis in the position of the parents, which meant that we were all treated as children. But what they were striking about was um, the conversion of the United States to a knowledge economy, this is 1964, which would supplant the railroads and that those students who had student deferments, which meant, as they were fully aware, that they did not have to go off to Vietnam and kill people, that they were being trained and tracked to be um, the cogs in the machine of the knowledge economy. And this is Mario Savio giving a great speech about the machine, but it also was very much about the fact that you were not allowed to talk about the war on college campuses. It was considered an insurrectionary act for which you could be expelled. And in fact, my partner at the time was expelled for a semester um, for having a student strike in which we talked about the war. And that was 1964 as well. But the student strikes uh, spread around the country and the world. And even on such a level as going to high schools where children wanted to be able to wear jeans and not boys didn't have to wear jackets and as um, a student in an honors program at Brooklyn College as an undergraduate I was not permitted to attend my class in the library because I was wearing pants in winter. So these are the Selma, we, we had a Selma March commemoration as well. And uh, this is the sanitation strike that Martin Luther King was attending in Memphis, was speaking at. Um, this was a, um, an anti-war mobilization in Harlem. And um, this is a phrase supposedly spoken by Muhammad Ali. And this is a still from a film with the same name by Newsreel. And I cannot possibly pass over the other kind of revolution that was so much a part of our, sorry, um, so much a part of our lives, which was, you know, we, people now say um, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, that's fine, but it was peace, love, and rock and roll at the time. Um, and. Um, these are some of the photographs that were widely seen, though possibly not Phillips Jones Griffiths one, which is really English, but in the US ranging from 63 through 72. Um, as you may know, everybody subscribed to Life Magazine, which was the mass market periodical. 
uh, that was basically a picture magazine, and so we got to see a lot of things that might that would not have been seen in other wars, because there was censorship, uh, official censorship, in uh, World War II, for example. I feel like I'm depressing everybody. I can't help it, I'm sorry. <laughs> You know, for the following decades, the whole um, take on the 60s was that it was a decade of turmoil and horror, and of course now there's a certain kind of sentimentalization and romanticization, which mostly has to do with the fashion industry, but uh, it, was, um, it was a pretty unsettled decade with many, many events. flower power. Yes, levitate the Pentagon. It was worth a try. It's Allen Ginsberg. This is sunrise at the, I wish I knew who took this picture. Sunrise at the Oakland Army Induction Center. Um, there was a lot of support on the part of um, basically middle-class kids um, for people who did not want to go, for their brothers who did have to go, and for those who burnt their draft cards and who went to Canada. Uh, it was a decade of urban insurrections, uh, including Newark, very close to me in New York City, that were unspeakable in their toll, and in fact, there were many more, these were just the most prominent ones. Uh, this is 68 in Chicago. Actually, Chicago also had a Puerto Rican uprising, which was very unusual um, the previous year. This is the whole country rose up after Martin Luther, that is, people in cities all around the country rose up upon the news of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. It says, Mayor Richard Daly of Chicago authorized police to shoot to kill any arsonist or anyone with a Molotov cocktail in his hand and to shoot to maim or cripple anyone looting any stores in our city. Um, Chicago, of course, is notorious for its kind of tough guy politics and for, in fact, only recently being held to account for torturing uh, African-American prisoners uh, in police stations over the decades. And 1968 was the Democratic Party National Convention in Chicago, and it says, for eight days, anti-war and counterculture groups, including the MOB, which was the name for the mobilization, the Yippies, which is Abby Hoffman and Friends, Women Strike for Peace, and the Southern uh, Christian Leadership Conference, the SCLC, paraded, held con uh, concerts, and occupied the parks. 24,000 police and National Guards were deployed. This is the Democratic, I just want to point out, it's Democratic Party. Days of belligerence on the part of the Chicago police culminated in a violent police riot on the night of August 28th. And um, we don't have to say police riot with a feeling of defiance about it because it was actually adjudged um, by a special commission to have been a police riot. Inside the convention hall, there were all kinds of activities, including the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, but Illinois delegates, including Mayor Daley, who was the guy yelling, and his son and future mayor, that would be Mayor Daley, 
uh, react to Senator Abraham Ribicoff's criticism of the Chicago police. Some observers claim Daley was shouting, fuck you, you Jew son of a bitch. After the convention, a federal grand jury was convened, and after Nixon took office, William Mitchell pressed for indictments. Eight protesters were charged, including Abby Hoffman and others, charged with crossing state lines to incite a riot and other crimes. The trial lasted months. They were acquitted, but five were convicted of crossing state lines, and all, including Bobby Seale, who was one of them, were convicted of contempt of court. What happened with Bobby Seale was he refused to cooperate, so the judge had him um, bound and gagged, and uh, his trial was separated, but in 72, all the convictions were reversed. There's Tom Hayden. And uh, this also in 1968, the Kerner Commission report if you read it today, you wouldn't be surprised at what it had to say. Uh, our nation is moving toward two societies, one white, one black, separate and unequal. Uh, the government did not release the report, but um, it was a bestseller. Anyway, these are two versions uh, of its publication. So what you do when you have a political problem is you set up a study committee, and that's what President Johnson did, and they produced this report, which it was not exactly what the government had hoped, which is why they didn't release it, but of course it was released and published anyway. Uh, and it said, investigate urban unrest and the scores of major insurrections, 159 riots in the summer of 1967 alone. Uh, Newark, Detroit, Atlanta, Boston, Cincinnati, Buffalo, nearby, Tampa, Birmingham, Chicago, New York, Milwaukee, Minneapolis, Rochester, Plainfield, and New Britain, Connecticut, uh, nationwide bestseller. So 1968 was a big year for assassinations and riots. Um, and meanwhile, the war is at its height. The Panthers, a Marxist-Leninist, neo-Maoist-based group, um, were formed as a self-help organization to organize within the black community and, in effect, to say um, the ballot or the bullet, which is actually a phrase of um, Malcolm X's, but to self-organize. Their breakfast program not only was Sterling, for anyone who knows the next level of the history of the counterculture, it was partially uh, instigated by Emmett Grogan of the Diggers in San Francisco, which is a really interesting coming together of efforts to build a society from the ground up that would resist um, the uh, strictures put on the lives of poor people. But it also, the breakfast program also was adopted by the U.S. government because their attempts to feed poor children breakfast was incompetent compared to what the Panthers did. And they helped the young lords transition from being a gang um, of Puerto Ricans in New York, they helped them convert to being also a kind of self-organized service group. This is the murder of Fred Hampton, which um, I realize I've put up this uh, film thing, but we all knew about it long before a film was made. Uh, the government denied it, of course. This is more Chicago uh, unspeakable behavior where they stormed into the apartment while everyone was asleep. Um, so Mark, Mark Clark was the guy who was supposed to be guarding. <laughs> you can't guard uh, against incursions, but you can't guard against an incursion like that. Um, they just stormed into the apartment and the, 
says fired between 83 and 90 shots, the Panthers one shot, uh, and um, Fred Hampton was killed in his bed, uh, and Bobby Rush, I think, may still be a congressman in Chicago. He's the guy that Obama tried to unseat, so transition to um, a different... Uh, so the backdrop to all of this is the war. There are constant protests against the war every week, every month, regardless of the other forms of uprising. Um, but I'm talking a little bit about, in a way this is close to me, I am talking about me and my development because I think sometimes it's useful for people to understand a motivation of how people make the work they do and how they come to the opinions that they have. Uh, so this was the days of rage. Someone wrote to me on Facebook and said uh, this week, I wondered where you were during the Chicago convention. I said I was standing in an apartment in Washington Heights with a one-year-old baby in my hand looking at the TV and thinking, what is going on, and similarly with the Days of Rage, the next year I had friends in this, including that guy who told me about the Gulf of Tonkin thing uh, earlier. So this was uh, organized by the weatherman uh, and SDS, and there's Abby again. I forget who this guy is. But this was, the Days of Rage, was very directly about stopping the war. Um, as, um, by this time I was living in Southern California and we knew what happened in Mexico City at Tlatelolco, which was completely suppressed, but we knew this that the police came in and murdered a bunch of students who were sitting in uh, uh, using the Olympics as a way of saying, look who you're taking care of, look what you're spending money on, and they just murdered them. So back to New York, and I was actually still living in New York at this time. I couldn't join the sit-in, silly me. Why would I? I was no longer a student, but um, with my kid in a baby carriage, I joined the one up at the Columbia University Medical School in my neighborhood. Um, that's Mark Rudd, who was a member. And in Paris, Le Jolie May. Which almost, almost brought down the Republic. But the CGT would not really mobilize its members. These are some solidarity um, efforts. Um, in part because of the fact that we, in what called itself the most advanced just like Germany had the most advanced culturally uh, dominant culture nation on earth, uh, and we were attacking essentially peasants in Vietnam who had no real means of fighting back. I'm not talking about the army and the guerrilla army, but I'm talking about a nation of very poor people in an, what we could call an economically undeveloped country, certainly not industrialized. Um, there was a lot of support. This is also coinciding with the moment of post-colonialism, which of course the Vietnam fight was part of. Uh, so there was a lot of romanticism and solidarity for um, other, other revolutions and other uh, wars. And this is about 
those who cross the border. Between 66 and 75, almost 240,000 Americans moved to Canada. In 69, the government allowed um, people who were dodging the draft to come over. And uh, in 1974, 27,932 Americans are registered as having crossed the border. And under President Carter, uh, amnesty was granted, but of course many people became landed immigrants. This I refuse to say anything about Quebec set, uh, separatism, but it was always present from 62 until later when de Gaulle had the nerve to come over and <laughs> support the movement. Anyway. Um, and we all know that the 60s were um, the birth of what are called the social movements, um, women's liberation. Gay liberation. Interesting, um, back when Gay liberation was very cognizant of its association with, um, w says against war and fascism. That was a major part of the start of the gay liberation movement. And so by this time, as I said, I'm living in California, but Southern California San Francisco State strike, just as I was moving there, longest campus strike in US history. Um, the Black Student Union and a coalition of other student groups known as the Third World Liberation Front led the strike, began on November 6, 1968, and ended March 20th, 1969. Uh, lots of police clashes because I'm going to fall right over and break my leg. Yes, <laughs> my other leg, yes. <laughs> At least it would get me to stop talking. United Farm Workers Organizing uh, Committee, this Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, and for the life of me, I can't remember who that is. It's probably Jim Jones. No, the guy who was killed by Jim Jones. Um, the Chicano Moratorium, which was a really important uh, event. Uh, the Chicano movement was really only getting underway and uh, uh, lots of Mexican Americans rejected the word Chicano, which they said was the same as basura. Why using this word? It was uh, um, a movement from a different direction. This is the death of Ruben Salazar during the Chicano moratorium. Uh, was killed inside the Silver Dollar Bar and uh, what became a martyr for the movement. And this is a march in Seattle that says, remember Ruben Salazar, our fight is at home, not in Vietnam. Chicano power, Raza Primero. And uh, let's not forget, that everybody read Rachel Carson's book and understood what it was about uh, starting in 1962 and it took a number of years for the environmental movement, it was called ecology at the time to take root and Earth Day began in 1970 and was later corporatized. AIM or the American Indian Movement uh, including the occupation of Wounded Knee and then another moment in our glorious history. It was quite a show. And a few art things that I have to say greatly influenced me. Uh, Sorry, this is moving on its own again. Carolee's performance, I'd never seen anything like it. Um, 
and uh, always the films of Jean-Luc Godard, including Le Petit Soldat and Les Carabiniers. Uh, and <laughs> and uh, the Angry Arts, um, which was, uh, I remember thinking at the time, this is awfully late. It was 1967, but at least they're doing something. Um, Faye Van Ronk is a young angry arts in Los Angeles, so 67. And Martha. <laughs> That's me and my boy on the Lower East Side, and then in Lucadia, California, uh, and in a bowl somewhere, presumably in California. This is the tough crew. You see San Diego of uh, a photo and video cabal, as we were called. Uh, and um, it was a small college at that time, but um, San Diego was a military town it had long been a military town. My aunt was in the Women's Army Corps in World War II, and she was a nurse in Balboa Park Veterans Hospital. Uh, it was a hop-in place, um, and the entire city was full of schools that all rose up together and marched against the war repeatedly, uh, including San Diego State and small colleges, and it says it here as well. And I remember we marched to Point Loma, uh, and uh, one of our pals burnt himself to death um, on the plaza. Um, I remember standing on the plaza. I often wonder, am I in this picture? I know exactly where I was standing. There was a, it was the time of the moratorium and they announced the um, murders of the, of the students in Kent State and Jackson State. And a few days later, George burnt himself to death. And um, speaking personally, I was walking my little boy across the plaza and I came upon the last minutes of this event. The fire was out. And I just stopped and I put my hand on my son's head and said, let's go to the cafeteria. Um, the red, the secret army organization, <laughs> we had a secret army organization of Nazis with, who were basically cops shooting up leftists in San Diego. Uh, Triton Times is the school paper. Uh, I just want to say that this was the daycare center that we established, uh, which lasted for a few decades. Uh, this is um, a student being arrested by one of my pals, Fred Lonadier, is the photographs, it's now. Uh, and this, let this be a representation of the kinds of actions I participated in. Normally you did not photograph the actions, nobody f on our side did, but this was uh, blocking a munitions troop train at the Del Mar crossing en route from Camp Pendleton Pendleton to San Diego. And what I remember most about it was that there were police with sharpshooter rifles and what we thought was the FBI. We knew not to take our kids on this because we saw the buses full of uh, local sheriffs hiding on the side roads. So you always had to make a decision, do you take your kids on demonstrations? But um, then the helicopters starting started to chase everybody through Del Mar for hours, but because I worked in an editing office in Del Mar, I knew where to go and to take people to avoid being arrested. They, they weren't shooting at people, but they did arrest people for this illegal act. 
Okay, so finally some art. God, that's ugly art. So this is some women prisoners of the two regime at the infamous Pulo Condori prison, sorry for the pronunciation, South Vietnam in 1973, which was part of my effort to say to people, could you notice that we're killing people and imprisoning people who are people even though you keep describing them as peasants in black pajamas. Um, and so I tried whatever way I could to say to women, these are people and they have identities and um, uh, this is, they were on these clothes were stenciled the name and date of birth and prisoner number. Um, of some of these women prisoners. This was my son's used but washed diapers with vile comments in which the Vietnam Vietnamese were referred to as gooks, which John McCain persisted in doing even when he ran for president. So obviously this is analogous to what was on the diapers before they were washed. I am a crude person. This is B-52 and Baby's Tears, um, which was an agricultural flat with the silhouette of a B-52 bomber, though it really isn't, but sort of. Uh, Baby's Tears is really the name of a plant. And uh, I just want to say I'm echoing myself. This is B2 in Sand from 2006. It's a stealth bomber, death from the air. So where did those montages come from? Well, this is what I was doing in the early mid 60s which is making, well, I was a painter, but we'll forget that part. Uh, I was making these photo montages. This is just a handy way to show them. And then I saw this in a tabloid. Kyoichi Sawada's um, photo of a couple of women wading across a creek with a bunch of kids and I was transfixed at my mother's dining room table. It was like looking at that and I just suddenly had an idea uh, that I could make flyers because this is what flyers looked like. They were ridiculous and these are the better ones. I thought I could do a better job. I could make flyers that tell you what's going on um, without any words, without, I just do it. You can see where they came from. And, um, I handed them out at demonstrations. My father had introduced me to the Xerox machine, a great invention. Um, and uh, this is this one in the San Diego newspaper, goodbye to all that. It's the same one in the previous slide. This is another one from, most of the images are from Life magazine. This one was not, this is architectural. This is the newspaper version. Um, 
these are recreated. I, I don't like to show these works without pointing out what their origin was, which is they were not framed works on a wall. Uh, and mostly they were black and white because I definitely could not afford color Xerox. But now that I've established my cred, I'll show you the works. They're cut and paste. Um, this one is not sharp, sorry. This is the one that eventually gave the title to the series. They were not, they were neither signed nor dated nor titled, but this is House Beautiful, and this is from House Beautiful magazine, um, the main scene. Seen that one before. A friend of mine who teaches in Paris said that one of her in Rennes, actually, one of her students asked, why does that boy have, a soldier have a baguette in his hand? This is the runway at Quezon, which was a place that we held with a siege for about a month for no reason. It was also in one of the earlier ones. This is the First Lady, Pat Nixon, in someone's gown. I never remember the name of the designer. It doesn't matter. The tondo above her is a still from the movie Bonnie and Clyde with Faye Dunaway being uh, killed by the government because this movie was considered emblematic of the condition of the generation now called boomers. Um, uh, in total revolt against the government, being mowed down by them. We're getting near the end. I just have to say, I didn't die in 1972. But there also was a few decades between them, and I did these only so I could say, we haven't learned a damn thing. We're right back there doing what we were doing, and if you think it's stupid that I'm doing something I did in the 60s and 70s, we're stupid. We are a stupid, stupid country. These are in the previous. It's George Bush and Jeb Bush. This man has one of the two signature injuries of the war, traumatic uh, limb injury or amputation, and the other is traumatic brain injury, both from IEDs. This is from 2008. I think that one is out of place. It may appear twice. This is, I have to say something about this photo. Um, this is, um, photo taken by the sadly deceased Anya Niedringhaus, a great photojournalist. This is when the U.S. was invading Fallujah for the first time and uh, stole some Iraqi horses and dressed up as Ben-Hur um, as a team building.
I'm showing you this one. The woman in the photo book on the Ottoman is Lori Piastua, the first known Native American woman to die as a U.S. soldier as opposed to at the hands of U.S. soldiers. And here is the My Lai massacre from Vietnam. That's not right. From 2008. And now for something completely different. Well, wait, next. These are British troops, by the way, and that's a wedding gown. Just to say, yes, yeah, see, this appeared before, sorry. I'm an American, I have to end with this. This is from 2016. And um, he is reminding us that he could kill anyone he wants and it wouldn't make any difference. And on, embedded in the wall behind him is the name of people of color who have been killed by police with impunity without suffering any consequences um, because he's ours. and uh, our current space warrior, and that's it. And I um, thank you for your patience and also for letting me say a little bit about the current wars. Are you supposed to come up? Am I stuck here? You're, you're That's what you're I thought. Staying. Staying Thank you very much, Martha, for putting this work into such a clear context. I think it was really helpful. Uh, we'd like to now uh, invite Melissa Ho, the curator of 20th century art at the Smithsonian American Art Museum to join Martha for a conversation. So now, how do we do this? Do we just use this? You had that line prepared. I did. I wrote, so I wrote great. everything out. Amazing. <laughs> I can't get ahead of you. <laughs> Should we take a seat? Yeah, yeah. I'm just seat. trying yeah. to find my yeah. phone. Okay. God, I have some water there. Oh, perfect. Oh, thank you. I might not be able to get up from this chair. Thank you, Martha, for that presentation. And um, thank you, Lisa and Kim, for inviting me to be part of this event this weekend. Um, so Martha and I know each other through an exhibition uh, that I organized at the Smithsonian American Art Museum about the impact of the Vietnam War on American art practice, art practice in the United States um, when the war uh, was at its height, um, and uh, you'll hear more about that tomorrow, but I just say that partly because, Martha, I realize it's um, almost exactly a year since when that yeah, show opened. That. <laughs> um, so just a note of gratitude, actually, that the conversation is still continuing and, in fact, expanding. Um, so I'm going to, I have a number of questions or topics that I hope Martha will riff on and then we'll open it up to uh, Q&A from the audience. Um, so Martha, of course you were among many artists who thought about the American war in Vietnam through the lens of gender from a position of feminism and you, you know, you, you showed the, the photo montages that preceded um, the ones that are now known as, as House Beautiful. So I wanted to ask you to talk more about feminism's role in um, voicing opposition to that particular war. Um, well, women have been taking a position against war for centuries because, just to put it as bluntly as possible, their sons and their husbands fight the war. Uh, and although you'll find the strange fact that the English suffragettes 
the most militant ones, the ones who were bombing post offices and so on, were upper class. Uh, and much as they uh, were interested in murdering any British figure who didn't support them once World War I was declared, they said, okay, we're calling it all off, and they sent their sons to war. So I say this because there's a class issue involved here. Of course, we don't have quite the stratification in the colonies here um, that uh, they had and have in Britain, but who knows? Uh, wealth creates its own stratifications. But um, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom was fighting against war from the late 40s through the 50s. And I think as the supposedly tender sex, women are all too aware of the human cost of war uh, on every side, not just because they're uh, I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier was a song from World War I, actually. Um, and uh, I think that one of the reasons, this is hard to say, the rebirth of the feminist movement as we know it in the United States was directly consequent on the mobilization against the war in Vietnam during which time the men on the left were so, yes, yeah, she's nodding, so unbelievably sexist and obnoxious. What? Yes, yes, literally. I won't even name the guys who were most responsible, but those who know, know. Um, and, and I will refrain from cursing. I was not a member of SDS, by the way. Um, but um, it became very obvious looking at the Bernie bros, I'm a Bernie bro, um, that something had to be done. And you could be fighting for the liberation of the working class, for other people, for the world, for Vietnamese people, and you're still saying all kinds of really amazingly obnoxious things to women and about women. And this was the beginning of women, uh, and of course there was a nascent women's movement outside it. There was also a bourgeois women's movement, partially, uh, I'll just say that when I was in college in the early 60s, <coughs> we were talking about the oppression of women. This has been a question for hundreds of years. I mean, Mary Wollstonecraft uh, and other women were writing, you know, Declaration of the Rights of Women and other things. Um, and, I mean, you have the problem of um, upper-class families uh, sometimes educating their daughters, but this was not carried through. So it was kind of like this strange thing where the daughters could be educated and you could have Ada Lovelace and all these amazing people doing things. But in general, women were the, in the lowest part of the hierarchy. So the struggle has constantly been reborn um, but there was, Betty Friedan wrote, first of all, Simone de Beauvoir wrote her book, The Second Sex, was translated in the late 50s in the US. And then Betty Friedan, who'd been a labor organizer actually, was talking about educated middle class women whose lives were wasted. So what I'm saying is, the women's liberation movement stemmed directly from the young women of the 60s uh, recognizing that they had to free themselves from the oppression of the men that they were fighting against the war side by side with and yet. But there were many women who did not see that as their first um, occupation. They were interested in separating from male domination. Mm. And I mean, you know, for the older people in the audience, and I don't know if this is true in the, you'll recognize this, I don't know if this is true in Canada, but I'm guessing it was, women couldn't, married women couldn't have credit cards. They had to have them through their husbands, they couldn't own property and so on. So all the English ideas about, um, you know, the passage of property rights and uh, personhood rights through the males were instituted in our society. So there was ample 
cause and justification for the women's movement than then for, um, but you have to understand that they, we drew our impetus from the civil rights struggle. That this is a direct result of the organization of and by African Americans to liberate themselves from the oppressive second, second status and the denial of civil rights. So there was a rolling thing, and then next year, gay liberation, and also the year after that, women in the art world. So there's a rolling recognition, and then the Chicano movement. Yeah. And uh, to some degree, though, this took a different form, the Asian movement out on the West Coast as well, the, from Washington all the way down to um, California. So. If I could connect that um, back to the work, so to speak, back to the work of artists, um, it was really striking to me looking at these images again, and then of course you, you brought up Carolee Schneeman. Um, I'm thinking also of um, artists like Nancy Spiro and Judith, Judith Bernstein, Liliana mm -hmm. Porter. Mm -hmm. What they're doing that's so different from some of the, the male artists mm -hmm. who are um, addressing the war is this really deft, and of course this is true of the image behind us as well, and others you showed, um, you know, a, a deconstruction of gender myths mm -hmm. as a way of critiquing the war. Mm -hmm. So um, that's obviously a big part of House Beautiful. I wonder if you can talk about not, you know, you mentioned the kinds of magazines that you're drawing the images from, um, but uh, how did that pl play out in terms of depictions of, because the Body Beautiful series is very much about um, commercial uh, representations, representations of, women's of women's roles. Uh, right. Um, I think something that I was trying to say, and this was really important to me, was that the false separation between ici et ailleurs was really, really on my mind, that we had this idea that we had our home and it was centered here and it was on this side of the world and over there were people who were not entitled and we are entitled. And it is the women who represent the home and the women who make the home and that it was incumbent upon me to say, this is about women far more than you realize. There may not even be a woman in the image and yet the entire representation of the home is about the hand of the woman, um, certainly as it was perceived at the time in both Life Magazine and House Beautiful and other, as we now call them, shelter magazines. The idea that it is your proper place, not only to be a bedroom appliance, but to make the bed and buy the bed and furnish the bed and put the pictures on the wall and the curtains on the windows. Oh, and cook dinner. But let's not forget the um, the other side of the coin here, because especially you know in our current moment of toxic masculinity and sort of this like overperformance of um, the masculine, uh, what's also striking to me are the the images of men's roles mm -hmm. in these um, photo montages, and um, you know there are two that you showed in particular that depict boys, mm -hmm. um, could you talk a, a bit about that side of it? Well, not only was I the mother of a boy, I actually consider males to be human, and therefore um, we need to understand that they're not, they may be, I mean, one thing that we understood from the Vietnam War was we did not have a professional soldier corps. We had boys from the neighborhood who were sent out there to fight and kill and be killed. And it, of course, we have tried to professionalize since then. I won't go into that because, of course, it's about the rural poor. Um, but um, in, so I thought, I'm not gonna show soldiers. First of all, there are no scenes of direct violence in these works. That was the last thing I wanted to do. I am not an expressionist. I'm an anti-expressionist. I want you to see 
what is in effect a tableau vivant and to think about it. And it's amazing how many people read violence into these things. Not incorrectly, but if you're an art historian or a critic, you're supposed to actually look. So that's sometimes a bit confusing. But I, I also wanted to talk about what about little boys? So here we have little boys at home. There, there were not a lot of pictures of little boys, so it wasn't that easy. But little boys at home on their bed, they're playing games, whatever they're doing. But outside the window is a young man being brutalized by a policeman, and um, there are other scenes in, in the one from 2004 with the Fallujah Ben-Hur right in the living room together with the soldiers is a man being arrested for, at a protest. Um, uh, I've never been good at uh, sanctifying one gender and demonizing the other. I think it's tempting, <laughs> but it doesn't, doesn't work for me that well. Um, if we're going to be human together, we need to be reminded of the differential roles we've been assigned and what we think about them and how to combat them. There's also one of a soldier sitting in front of a tract house on the lawn, um, um, one of the few where I just have a soldier, uh, the only one, I guess, just, and also a soldier is being buried. Yes. Um, yeah. So. Uh, Interestingly, I feel like those are two of the images that are less discussed. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not surprisingly, yes. We would like to slot our reception of certain types of work into as narrow a compass as we can manage, which is why I feel it's always important to show the work, the body beautiful work that I did before and talk about how that led me into trying to make these that in a similar way were a tableau about how we live our lives or how we represent people or how people are seen. And sometimes uh, people say that these works are about showing the public what they didn't see, but it's the opposite. And anyone who remembers where they came from knows they were from the, the magazine that was on everyone's coffee table, and also yeah. the living room war was in our living room. Yeah, I mean, I think that can't um, be underscored enough how different the media environment was in the mid and late 60s mm -hmm. uh, as compared to today. Mm -hmm. So the, the phrases living room war, television war, these are the, these are the years when broadcast news um, is, has come to full maturity and more and more Americans certainly are getting their news from the television. And then there's the fact that print is still actually a thing. <laughs> <laughs> and you have these mass circulation magazines that had um, a readership that is unimaginable uh, today. Um, I did notice actually in your more recent, um, the, the ones depicting uh, the wars in Afghanistan, the endless war in Afghanistan and Iraq, um, that the images are more graphic, I feel yes. like. Do you have any um, yes, reflections on too. that? Um, I think, in a way, I'm someone who sifts what's available and says, like, to look at it from the other gender point of view, I get asked why are there models in these? Uh, runway models, which I didn't show. You didn't have them before. Yeah, we didn't have, um, <laughs> I'm gonna say something totally rude, which is that the general picture of a fashion model in the 60s was of a dumb clothes horse, and definitely they were not considered to be superstars or celebrities, supermodel. They were not, they were barely, con they were working women. They weren't even like, so what? It took a while. It took the late 60s and the, the Abaddon and a few other people. But, but in terms of digging, right, these, these would have come from the internet, not from No, there's print. nothing from no. the internet, no. The only thing that's from the internet is Lindsay England herself. Um, I went for magazines again. Oh, and uh, there's one other image from the internet. You're old school, Martha. No, I wanted these to be as old fashioned as possible. 
so that I could literally say to people, say, why are you doing that again? Uh, say, yes, I'm really doing it exactly the same with scissors. Um, but Lynn, nobody wanted to publish a picture of Lindy England because she was a designated monster. She was the woman holding the man on the dog leash uh, from Abu Ghraib, and so no one wanted her photo in their paper, except maybe at trial. Um, so I had to get that from the internet. But um, yeah, they're more violent, but not still not violent. And I wonder actually if no we No shooting, no blood. I, yeah, and I a wonder if, if um, we, we um, perceive them differently too because the current wars are ones that are sort of invisible. Even more distant. They're really sort of kept, kept out of everyday life Think in a way. Think about what's happening in Idlib right now. By contrast, I wanted to also ask you about, um, you mentioned about moving from New York to Southern California in the later 60s, and I think there was even some back and forth it a little bit before you, you kind of landed out there for a little bit longer and I moved time. Canada. Um, there's the Canada chapter Vancouver. too. So the essentially going from the center of the US art world to the center of the US military industrial complex and uh, living in a part of the country where it would have been completely visible, um, the, the constant shipping out of, of men and arms um, out of Long Beach and San Diego. Was that a, a, a shock to you going from the East Coast to, to California in regards to your engagement with the war and also your, your work as an artist? Hmm, why haven't I thought about this before, really? Um, and set in UC San Diego, where you ended up, yeah. um, you know, is, is, is part of that military-industrial complex in yeah. at least an indirect way. Uh, Cold War. What? Well, well the, the, the development of the UC The system, system. Yeah. yeah. But at that point, it was such a tiny school with only two colleges that um, it, it was supposed to be a magnet and a hub, so you had industries around it, and it's the same, it was the same thing that Mario Savio and his bunch were complaining about, that this was the people being groomed to join the military industrial complex and the military industrial information complex. And of course, that's why I showed the pictures of our action on the troop the material train between Camp Pendleton and so on, it was everywhere, it was all around us, secret uh, laboratories on Point Loma and so on. But to be perfectly honest, one of the things that struck me the most about San Diego was how massively segregated it was and how shocking mm. it was to realize that you, that people were so successfully ghettoized that you rarely saw a person of color outside their particular neighborhoods, mm. which for a New Yorker was deeply shocking. But um, whoever made it to college usually was going to wind up in these uh, multi-racial, multi-ethnic anti-war activities. So we mixed, but this the whole the whole town was terrible. It was like a small southern town. It was run by two guys. It was totally right wing. It had these secret army or organization going around and shooting at people. It had Nazis. It had preppers, though they weren't called preppers. It was just a very strange place to be. And surfers. <laughs> I look at the art that grew up there. What? And look at the art that grew up in that environment. It's, I mean, maybe you could Ooh. say, well, you oh. and Fred. But and I Al showed you how, look how nasty we look. <laughs> I'm posturing for the camera like <laughs> tough people in the basement. How many years were you in San Diego? Uh, 10, I guess, and two in San Francisco. And when was the Vancouver chapter? Um, at the end, 1980, when I moved to Burnaby. Actually, I moved to Vancouver to teach in Burnaby. 
at Simon Fraser. I lived on commercial. And We've wound our way to Canada. Maybe it's time to open up the questions to the audience here. Is there a, a microphone or just sort of get up and holler? There's a mic. Are there any questions in the audience? Or nasty comments. Oh, it's Canada, you won't do it. <laughs> they might surprise you, who knows? Hello, Martha. Uh, I have a question, uh, and it, it'll also tie to uh, Julia, who showed before you. Um, and you were just, it's kind of a segue from what you were just talking about as well, uh, with your experience in Southern California and uh, like, like segregated living situations uh, in populations of the suburbs. Um, or I'm wondering what your thoughts are like uh, after viewing Julia's film which is uh, shot in a suburban uh, housing, di housing situation in the suburbs of Toronto, not suburbs of Toronto, but close to Toronto. Uh, and then your uh, House Beautiful project, which uh, has a lot of images of kind of idealized suburban life, uh, especially in the, the white flight kind of sense where it's like uh, the idealized, uh, space for like white American social reproduction of people. Uh, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on like the contemporary, uh, like Southern California, which is like the largest congregation of overseas Vietnamese people is in the of, Saigon. Of, of the Vietnamese people, yeah. In That's Orange County. In Orange County and also in LA itself, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and it's mostly suburban now. Yeah, or, uh, suburbs. Um, well, I don't, I'm not equipped to speak about this except that it is, and that as with the Cubans, and pardon me for making this analogy, there is this idea of people who are brought over somewhat grudgingly or seen as some kind of insertion of people inclined toward republicanism on the part of republicans, but in but people are people and they're resistant to that and also their children are resistant to that. So we're seeing, uh, and you know, this is just like vague sociology, um, people who, and I thought what was so amazingly powerful was this issue of I'm home but really I'm Vietnamese, but I guess if you ask me, I'm from here, I guess, but you know, that, that kind of divided self that says I have a different self, but I've evolved, and of course my children are different. Um, I think that you could say this about virtually any immigrant group, that the process of recognition, self-recognition, rejection, and um, integration, various degrees of uh, integration is, is creates a complex society that starts out exclusionary and becomes what was called first in Canada multiculturalism in the 60s. But also, um, this feeling that what was home no longer is home, not just because you don't live there anymore, but because, of course, the people there are no longer who they were when your family left. And um, we have all kinds of myths about what immigration means, but especially now when people can fly or go back somewhere, it's nothing like the idea of saying goodbye and never going back again, though that also was a thematic in your film. Uh, I didn't think I could go back. Um, but I'm not equipped to talk about this. Um, I was going to say something about Canada in this regard, but I don't remember what it was. But it's a provocative question, and I think really important um, 
in terms of people trying to find their voice. So there was one thing that I thought was interesting because it's um, the question of we're immigrants, we have to be grateful. Um, but in fact, thinking back to the, um, the very large immigration of Jews and Italians to the United States at the turn of the previous century, it was interesting that they imported political uh, forms of dissidents that immediately created a ruckus over here, even though that didn't over here, meaning uh, in the New World. I'm talking specifically about New York and Chicago. Um, and um, in a way, that picture of the dangerous immigrant, which alternated between people bringing in um, disease and people bringing in political disease, is now being applied by the US to people from Spanish-speaking countries, though not Spain. Um, so I think there are different presuppositions about the relationship between being an immigrant and the country that gives you uh, an entry or succor. Uh, I think in, in the case of the early 20th century immigration, it was very clear that it was about bringing in a working class workforce and the reason for immigration in um, more recent times is often very different and the motives are often not clear. They are presented as um, a humanitarian, but not often. And this idea that you can't, you can't criticize because they've given you a home, I mean, that's a real feeling. So I'm, I'm just saying, I'm not equipped to talk about the Vietnamese experience in Orange County, um, but it's been interesting to watch the relationship of people to politics and local politicians and also to starting uh, stores on the strip malls and a kind of a, a, a finding or becoming rooted in California. Hi, Martha. It's Sarah Diamond. It's wonderful to um, have you here in in Toronto. She knows that I was <laughs> at Simon Fraser. I can Fraser. testify. She was my professor at uh, Simon Fraser University. Um, I'm trying to formulate this. Um, when I was very young in Toronto, I was um, very engaged in the anti-war movement here. Um, and one of maybe the different qualities, um, you know, in Canada was that um, because we were not directly involved in the war, um, there, were, there was a lot of... Um, engagement of um, activists who were from North Vietnam in Canada um, and people in the South who um, um, were um, active um, from the communist perspective. And there were um, film series and um, a lot of exposure to what I would describe as a kind of aesthetic, mm -hmm. um, which was a sort of social realist aesthetic, mm -hmm. um, which also you can see in the work um, when you look at the sort of um, left and particularly particular parts of the left, um, the student movements in the US. But here it was a very deep quality of um, kind of resistance art um, I'm talking very early 70s here, um, you know, through, through the 70s. And um, I'm, it's a sort of double question. I mean, w one of the remarkable things about your work is it's a very different aesthetic. You know, it comes out of the sort of photomontage practices, um, you know, of uh, the 20s and 30s in, in Europe, and it, it, but it's not social realism. Mm -hmm. And you know, you're, you're working at a time when so much of the work is social realist, mm -hmm. and so much of the work here was social realist mm -hmm. in terms of support of the war. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious about, it's a double-pronged question, what kind of exposure was there in the US to um, you know, cinema, uh, et cetera, coming out of North Vietnam, um, and, um, and the anti-war movement, mm -hmm. um, kind of embracing of that. And, and how did you step away from social realism when it was such a predominant part of, um, you know, the kind of anti-war practice? Because I'm a bad person. <laughs> I, so I was an abstract painter, abstract expressionist painter. Um, and, um, 
looking at the work of the social realists of the U.S. from the Ashcan School and even from Kata Kulwitz in Germany, I just, no. The Sawyers, I, no. I couldn't stand the sentimentality of it. It drove me mad. And although I appreciated Kulwitz's sentiment, I just, I couldn't do it. I, I am in many ways a rationalist and I was more influenced, not by Hartfield, because we hardly knew any Hartfield, though eventually I was, um, because you know he was a communist, so the US certainly wasn't gonna publish his books. And I'm not talking about the films from North Vietnam and so on now, I'm talking about my own development in the early 60s. I was interested in um, a kind of, uh, from, uh, as a teenager, in surrealism, and Dada and uh, Max Ernst and the La Semaine de Bonté, which I thought was amazing. Uh, and the idea of um, surrealism as itself setting up a space or a room, that's what I hit upon, a rational space and a rational narrative within a space. And so I used to go to Museum of Modern Art when I was a kid and look at uh, Magritte and various other people um, who were working in that realm and I would consider that fairly cold. And that's why I say I'm a bad person. I figured that the sentiment is ours but that um, the, the expression of it, I wanted to ask you to think, not just to feel. You will bring the feelings you have, but please let's think. Let's not just say, oh, the, the thems that we're killing or the poor little baby. Let's think about the fact that we are them, they are us. So that, you know, I just, I'm a European. And I do wanna say that much as I love these women and they're my friends, um, Nancy and um, uh, the other women, Mae Stevens, also no longer with us, uh, and uh, uh, the, the other anti-war women, they were working in New York and I was in California. It wasn't until I came back again that I even got to know them, though I love their work, Judith Bernstein. Uh, I always loved and appreciated it, but that was much closer to a heroic uh, abstract expressionist painterly tradition, which I had eschewed. Well, Carolee Schneeman, oh. for sure. Well, Carolee is an expressionist, yeah, sure. though our last appearance together, she practically hit me. This is two years ago. When I said, well, you're more an expressionist, not more a rationalist. She said, I'm not an expressionist. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, well. Uh, but she was Artodian, and so, so was um, Nancy, yes. And even Leon, to some degree. So Sekula had a big argument with Leon about the physiognomic fallacy. And this is why he wound up rejecting Alga Zander, who I totally love. Sorry, folks. Um, because of the idea that um, that you somehow load, it's uh, the face of a person with their evil qualities, and, um, or you, you demonize an individual rather than who they are. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. One one thing that you didn't mention just now in. Um, the, you, tracing the genealogy for yourself was pop art, but you oh, have yeah. talked about that yeah, yeah. before. Do you want to? Yeah, well, that's what, when I was still in high school, it, I took a look at pop and I thought, oh, shit. Big decision point here. You mean art doesn't come to you like a spirit from who knows where and tells you what to do? Style is a choice because that's what pop meant to me, that style was one of the factors you actually manipulated, and I thought, okay, now I have to make a choice. Am I with the, um, 
assemblage of driftwood people or am I with the second nature commercial culture people and damn it, I'm with the second nature commercial culture people. I understand that this is our world. They're, and this is also about, pardon me again, you know, Hegelianism and this kind of uh, Marcusean uh, Hegelian negation of the negation and it, the saving the space. It is like Michael Fried and you save the space. <laughs> what we learn from minimalism, of course, is that the work is in the room with you. You are in the room with the work and there is no transcendent space. There's no sublime. And so that all figured into why my work doesn't look like Katie Kollwitz or Raphael Sawyer or uh, socialist realism, which looks, you know, there's a lot to like about social real, socialist realism, except not. <laughs> it's like, okay, some of it's terrific, but it's like advertising. It is advertising. And unfortunately, advertising took one look at that stuff and said, that's it. This is our form of surrealism. Let's do that. And so. Um, thank you, Martha. Uh, Tyler. Uh, oh, there you are. Yeah, Sorry. I, I'm um, getting reflections. So we're at the University of Toronto. Um, and I thought that it might be um, right to ask uh, you did maybe uh, speak a little bit about whether or not Marshall McLuhan's um, ideas were... Who? Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, whether or not there was, there was any, any bits of Marshall McLuhan going on uh, in the development of the ideas and, and how you were working or if there was any influence there. I taught the mechanical bride every year for 30 years. <laughs> Past that, mm, even though I was in the video community, I used to shrink away from, you know, the global village people, not really. Um, so, I mean, I think what, what happened to McLuhan is he fell in love with his subject, which he had formerly been oh so critical of, and I'm still with the early McLuhan and his really fantastic uh, takedown of the entire, um, Televisual and industrial uh, advertising. It's like like Roland Bart with mythologies. I thought this was brilliant critique, brilliantly put. And although the rest of the stuff was fun, when he gets to the mysticism, I'm <laughs> sorry. It's all right. Not so much driftwood. We did all read the medium as the message, though, I have to say. If that's Hi. what it was called. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Um, during your presentation, it occurred to me that it was really important to you that your work be instrumentalized or in the service of a movement. Right, like your, f uh, you know, your first instinct when you create these photo collages is that they can be flyers and they can be communicative, and even when you were giving us that wonderful overview, you know, when you were talking about the sort of political history over the decades, you know, you express so much of that story through, uh, you know, these pieces of design that really like aestheticized political movements. And it got me thinking, you know, for an artist working today who, say, would have, you know, similar aims to instrumentalize their artwork in service of a movement, um, they would be encountering a very different context, right? For one, it's a world without a life magazine, right? Which is to say without uh, a near universal, like, visual like, like lexicon or, 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 or monoculture. Um, and, you know, we're, we're living today in a political climate where our politics are already so stylized, right, before they even get to us for initial consumption. And so I guess what I'm wondering is, I mean, um, how do you see the challenges of instrumentalizing artwork today in this cause? Or I guess maybe a, a, a more fair way to put this question would be, are there contemporary artists working today in this political climate um, whose work serves a similar purpose who you admire? How would I know? I mean, this is deeply a question for you to answer. 
I can't be someone from now in the same way that I was someone from then, but one would hope <laughs> that this is something that uh, has a certain degree of um, indigeneity. That is, it's from the context, the t spatio temporal, though the spatial is another question. What is space? Where is it? Uh, certainly the temporal and uh, um, te technological context of now. It's interesting that you so easily say instrumentalized. Um, I would say communicative, which you also said. Um, and I would say that what, you know, I had to get back to talking about myself when I was working on the photo montages, I had this moment where I said to myself, so people will say you're doing propaganda, and I thought, oh, that's awful, but wait, is it? Okay, I'm a propagandist, this is propaganda. But it's also not all that I do. But on the other hand, um, the, I mean, if nothing else, human beings make meaning, and everything, um, you know, everything has a connotative resonance beyond the immediate communication. That's something that communication theory itself will tell you, that there's always uh, a resonance and um, unexpected uh, meanings that emerge and also the unconscious. Um, so sure, we can make propaganda, we can make advertising, we can remove our names from it, but the real question is what is, what is the point of what we're doing and what are the means that we grab that we find most conducive to speaking to people now? But I'm far too old. Um, to be able to actually jump outside my own lineage and do that, but you can. And it sounds like this is something that occupies you. Yeah? Uh, this might be just a jump off from that question. Um, I was thinking about uh, in your 2001 text, uh, post uh, documentary, post photography, there's a really great line that I always go through with my students, um, which is, as time passes, specificity fades and projection more easily does its thing or does mm -hmm. its work. Mm -hmm. um, and I keep on coming back to my students with that in line with the kind of idea of citation and authenticity and care that specifically when working with appropriation or with uh, archival photographs or something like that, there is a kind of uh, a diligence to citation. And we see this existing in the digital world and it's part of the kind of like uh, authentic reaction as packaged as that is, as kind of a commodity fetish as that is to the digital world. And I'm, but I'm wondering, is there a kind of, do you think that there's a kind of radical ethical potential in unknowing, in not knowing, in that projection, right? Do you think that you could make an abstract judgment like that without understanding what is the context in which you would make that judgment that it's okay simply to read without trying to excavate and do an archeology? span mm -hmm. Am I mishearing you? I'm, maybe it's more about just the need for it to ground something. I, we, I talk about this with my students on, in the context of like Barbie Zeltzer's um, About to Die the, and her kind of looking at journalistic images and breaking them apart from the, the citation of those images. Mm -hmm. And what happens with the image when it's ungrounded or un unmoored from language and the, the kind of radical, even emotional p charge that can happen when something doesn't have that context. And I'm wondering if that, that line from your text or, or in, in your thinking about collage or appropriation as stra strategy, if there's a kind of potential in that unmooring that kind of uh, can be activated against the fetish for authenticity or for citation? I think we're on opposite sides here. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, if nothing else, on opposite sides of the idea that 
images constitute meaning without language because that's the first thing I absolutely don't believe. I actually believe the opposite, mm -hmm. that meaning is conditioned upon and con by the context, linguistic context, even for people who can't speak that, and that there's a, a it's not that I want to say there's an ethical lapse of responsibility to an image, but I can't forget my friends Susan Mizellis and Henry Madison going around in the 80s and talking about how their, Im their images of actual war were having captions changed by magazines that published them with false captions and the difficulty of trying to actually convey what it is they felt their job was to convey, which is an actual description of something occurring between human beings in which real things are at stake. So that's overhyping the need for responsibility and you know, you can say, well, a girl can dream, can't you? And you can fantasize about something. But here's something, this is, you, you realize you're promoting fake news. I mean, this is the most straightforward argument for back in 2016 or so, people on my Facebook feed would post crazy things that weren't correct about the people they didn't like. And I would say, this is fake. This is obviously not right. What, what did you like about this? Why did you post this? And people would say, well, it could have been true or I liked it. And this has started to happen again. And people again are saying, I liked it. It could have been true. I'm in the wrong game if that's the game we're playing where you post things that are supposedly true or to use your word authentic. And they're false. <laughs> like I said, I'm a rationalist. I believe in science. I believe in more true versus less true things. I believe that there is outright lying and I think that the way we make our way through the world depends on being able to have a compass where we can say that's not true. But of course you're talking about something in the realm of aesthetic. So that was the other word that I wanted to pick on, aestheticizing, oh that must be bad. But um, I just don't, it's so funny, while I was in the plane on the way up here, I was thinking, post-photography, post-documentary, and then you said it. I thought, wow, that was weird. But I still think that documentary has a place, and that in fact, it's interesting to see that when I was writing that was at the nadir of documentary when no one wanted to know anything that was supposed to be true because it was boring and it was not affective enough um, and it wasn't authentic because it was supposed to be too authentic and now people are desperate for documentary and documentary this and documentary that, even things that aren't documentary, but that's okay. Um, so, um, I don't know how we navigate forward without trying to say, okay, we can have a playpen, but we also do have a responsibility to the information that comes our way. Um, that's all, so, line in the sand. Someone here wanted, you, yes. Thank you so much, Martha. Um, my question perhaps is a bit more general, um, but uh, I wanted to ask you because you've been an influential for me as an artist, but also as an activist. And um, I want to hear you to, to know your opinion about your role as an artist and activist or the relationship between activism and art. How do you see it? and? Yeah, I would like to know your view about that kind of connection and relationship. I'm a total liberal. I think you can be an artist without having any impulse toward activism whatsoever. And I also, uh, I am hesitant to claim the role of activists for myself because I think activists are people who really dedicate themselves to continuous 
political and social activism, and I would say that I'm first and foremost an artist. I have been active in a number of movements and causes, uh, and uh, I couldn't be otherwise because I am the preachy sort. I always would like to move towards social justice, most broadly put. Long before the term social justice warrior was coined, I could have been accused of being one myself. But um, I think we need to honor activists for actually being activists and to recognize that as artists we can stand with activists and work with activists and maybe become activists, but then our role as artists are somewhat different. Uh, I wouldn't want to discourage anybody, but I also feel that it's not possible for me to be continuously in the service of one form of activism, for example, homelessness, which has been a major part of what I've been engaged in, but I would never be able to claim the role of activist or even somebody interested in critiques of architecture, for example. So I just want to, like, reduce the size of the halo or the bubble that goes along with the term activist without discouraging people. And again, I want to say if you, you meaning someone, can find a role where you're comfortably, constantly an act, I mean, I think maybe a lot of, a lot of artists can be defined as activists today who weren't before um, in a way that they weren't before, but sometimes those people um, are rejected by their own community, which I find very painful. I'm thinking in particular of a, uh, an artist in the US whose work is beloved by some and really hated by others, and I think that's one of the things that happens is that the the problems of the art world in the US in particular complexify this because you become accused of appropriating an issue and turning it into a brand, you know, all this horrible career stuff. So this, this is, you know, a dangerous terrain. I hope I'm not turning you off. Uh, that's not my intention. It's just, it was matter to know your opinion. Thanks. It was matter to know your opinion. Oh, oh yeah, I heard you. Thank you. The lights are difficult for me. I feel an energy for people to leave. <laughs> I want to thank both of you for um, a great conversation, uh, uh, great questions, and uh, thank you, audience, for thank everything you. that you have uh, participated in today. Um, yeah, and please join us tomorrow uh, morning when Melissa Ho will start the day with a discussion of her 2019 uh, groundbreaking exhibition at, from the Smithsonian American Art Museum entitled Artists Respond, American Artists in the Vietnam War, which we, Lisa and I, both had the privilege of, of visiting last, uh, last summer. And, and it was a tremendous show, yes. a very, very eye-opening yes. uh, exhibition, I thought, and I was struck with the artists that were in the show and kind of the artists that weren't in the show, like not, not, not that you missed anybody, but, <laughs> but I mean, I, I mean, it was a very, it's, it, it was a very focused number of artists working on this mm -hmm. issue at the time of the war. And I, I think it's the hardest thing to do and I really admire you for it, Martha, mm -hmm. like to make art about your mm -hmm. own time mm -hmm. is the hardest thing I think to do. Mm -hmm. We constantly make work looking back on things, but yeah, we're, we're back. Point. We're backwards people. Yeah. <laughs> um, we uh, also want races. to. If you're coming tomorrow, you should. Uh, uh, we're going to start. Uh, at, there'll be coffee at nine, Good. so you can kind of roll in. <laughs> okay. It's a you big know, day. It's a big day, uh, and there will be lunch. It's catered, so there will be lunch. There'll be a lunch break. And it's all here, and because someone, because there is no food otherwise, there's nothing. We are on an island, as we like to remind ourselves. So, uh, I really, again, want to thank you both very much for kicking this off so wonderfully. So, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Who's next to these?
Look, I stood oh, those, up. I think those are Julie's. Okay.